Taryn, if you only had one minute to give music artists the best music marketing advice or music business advice you could, what would you say? One minute on the clock, go. Okay, uh, I would say stop trying to make your money in Spotify streams. That's going to take forever. And if you've had any even remote success in in Spotify streams, you know that that is not even going to be enough money to to pay a single, not even a car bill, right? So. Uh, my advice is stop looking at streams and start looking at brand deals uh, with other brands that are like-minded. You know, if you are a rock artist uh, that talks mainly about, I don't know, skateboarding, maybe there's some skateboard brands that you can go after that have a lot of money that are trying to get in front of the same audience that you're also catering to that is going to have this synergistic quality to them that's actually going to allow them to uh, pay you you know, way more than what your Spotify streams would be that much. For how big do you have to be as an artist to start actually getting brand deals? Like, let's say it's on an Instagram account, for example. Like, what, what What's the kind of minimum follower count or, or view count that someone has to have before they should even bother? Hmm. I don't, you know, it, it, it really depends because, I mean, I think that if we're talking about you, you know, it also it also matters how big the brand themselves is, right? There mm-hmm. are some more, there are smaller brands that are going to take on smaller clients, especially let's say local brands, right? Maybe there's like a local uh, restaurant that if you are also an artist that has a little bit of like a local following, uh, even if you're what seven seven to ten thousand people that are following you, but if but they're localized, you know that's an audience that 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 restaurant is going to be able to reach that otherwise they might not be able to reach. So, so, you know, uh, obviously we're talking, if it's a restaurant, that's going to be a smaller amount of money that they're going to be able to offer you. But you know, that I I would say that it scales up as you scale up. So right around probably somewhere between 30 to 50,000 people is where you start to get into like some serious change where you could, if you were hustling full time, uh, you know, pay pay all your bills every month off of off of those numbers uh, with brand deals like that. Uh, again, not like an extreme amount of, of followers, you know, in, in yeah. the whole theme of themes. Uh, but actually, a lot lower than I was kind of expecting to be able to like actually pay your bills with thirty to fifty thousand followers. Yeah, well, and and I think that what matters is how distinct your branding is too. If you're kind of all over the place, if you're just saying, oh, I'm a music artist and all you show is your music, obviously that's going to, that's going to be a little bit of a, a, a that's going to, that's going to change your results a little bit because even a brand is going to look at that and maybe not understand their spot in that. Um, but if you are a brand that has a very strong identity in skate culture, for instance, that is, that's something then at that point where there are going to be brands that are going to go, okay. That's thirty thousand people who are in the skating community that we can that we can hit directly for yeah. whatever two thousand dollars if they post this video or whatever you know and and rent money. <laughs> yeah, a lot of artists I don't think realize that content creators that are non musicians, uh, let's say YouTubers for example, I don't actually make that much money from YouTube. Right. I make all my money on this channel from my products and services and uh, consulting, coaching, you know, courses, ad agency, all that jazz. That's yeah. like the vast majority of it. I also have affiliate stuff, which is nice. And then sponsorships, which is nice. But like I can get one sponsorship in a month and that pays me more than what YouTube gives me in a month. Just for one 90 second brand integration. Um, and for music artists, I don't think they realize that the streaming money, the streaming money is kind of like the YouTube AdSense money. Like honestly, in terms of dollars per thousand views or streams, it's not that different. Yeah. So I don't think a lot of artists realize that when they get into it, that the music itself, unfortunately, ends up not being the main product. It ends up being the thing that builds the audience that then makes them want to go get your actual products, whether that's like a sponsored thing or like merch or Patreon or tour or Absolutely. Yeah. And, and also I think that it's kind of volatile, right? Because like, if you're, if you're trying to, if, if your business model is that you're trying to make your money off of AdSense or, or Spotify streams or Instagram views or TikTok views, like 
it's all volatile. It's, it's volatile because you're putting, you're putting your entire business model into someone else's platform, it, yeah. not into your, not into your own brand identity. Right. So the moment that that disappears, let's say all of a sudden, I don't know, TikTok gets banned or whatever. That's not going to happen, but, but, let, but, but let's say it does, right. All yeah. of a sudden you lose, you lose your entire business model from one platform, from someone else's platform. It's yeah. not like you have any control over that. So keeping the control, keeping the control in your own world, having something where you can say, Hey, this is how I make money. And, and no one can take that away from me is like, you know, as a musician, important. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So um, for anyone here who doesn't know who you are, you know, who are you? What do you do? Sure. Uh, <laughs> my name's Taryn Gray. I uh, live in Los Angeles from San Diego. Uh, my dad is a, a lighting designer for theater. So I grew up like literally every adult around me was acting and singing and, and dancing. And that's just what adults did in my, in my world. They were like storytellers. So I, I come by it very naturally. Um, tried to get into, did a lot of pop music, um, started a label in San Diego, started working with other larger labels, doing A&R and everything like that. Uh, got the chance to, uh, when I moved up here 10 years ago to LA, started working with Atlantic and Universal uh, with new artists on their labels. And then quickly realized that there was uh, more money. You know, this that was during the time period of like, of like Facebook pages, you know, and Twitter. And so uh, when, when I was in all that, I started obviously gaining tools in the, in the digital advertising space through that. Uh, realized during the rise of Instagram that there was more money outside of the music field and in uh, plastic surgery. So I worked with a lot of different plastic surgeons on building their brand identity because they all wanted to be rock stars of their community, basically. So mm. there's a lot of the same tools, to be honest. Um, and then uh, when TikTok came around, I was actually on Musical.ly way back in the day, uh, which is like kind of a cringy, weird thing. I don't know if it's like a proud statement, but I was on Musical.ly uh, and, and watched it transition to TikTok and then um, got this opportunity while I was working with, uh, I, was, I was working with um, some other influencers in, in the beauty and, and fashion space at the time and uh, got an opportunity from Yamaha Music to come on board with them uh, as their creative director for TikTok. Uh, so I did that, I'm still there, uh, and that's like one of my mainstays. And then on the side, I run this company with my wife called uh, Social Play Digital, where we help brands um, on TikTok, you know, figure out, first of all, their, their target audience, their tone of voice, what kind of content they want, what kind of posting cadence they wanna do. And, and just deliver content for them uh, in the TikTok space. Nice. Yeah, and, and the way I found or heard about you was at NAMM, where you were given a talk called something like... Advanced yeah, advanced, advanced uh, strategies for TikTok, but focusing mainly on SEO, because that's really, really what I believe is, is the, the future. We're already in the future, but it's where we are and, and moving forward, what the future of TikTok is really going to be favoring is is they're, they're competing with YouTube and, and Google as a search engine, not Instagram. So, so the more that you think about TikTok like Google and less like Instagram, that's where, that's where we're headed to. Um, I think, it's, I think the, the last time I heard the, the number was like, uh, I think it's like 36% of all Gen Z searches on TikTok first, not Google. And, and it's obviously a number that's rising. And so it's a viable thing where it's like we, if that's, that's a huge chunk of people who are going to TikTok for information prior to any other search engine. Um, and so right. the more we can sort of look at TikTok that way, uh, not as a, not as a place to like create fun videos, but as a place to create uh, videos that have great search engine optimization, uh, the, the more we're going to be successful at getting, at getting seen on, in that space. Yeah, and your your talk at Nam on TikTok was uh, a little bit like I don't want to call it life changing. That might be blowing a little too much smoke up your <laughs> backside, but but um, but like I, I would say in terms of how I think of TikTok, it like completely changed how I think about the platform, and we kind of changed our entire TikTok strategy for this channel. Wow, as a result wow. of that. 
That's I, awesome. It, it makes so much sense. And like, I, we haven't seen if like the changes will actually cause a positive improvement yet, but just intuitively it made a lot of sense. And so we are like, just let's just dive right into this. This makes sense. So the thing that I thought was most interesting about how you talk about TikTok is, you know, obviously the whole, it's, it's an SEO platform. People are searching for stuff. So you need to optimize for that. But how does the TikTok algorithm know what you're posting about? And you, you gave some examples for like, how do they interpret your video? How do they interpret what you say? How, how should you talk about the, the text in your post? And how should you think about the hashtags in your post? So could you kind of walk through totally. that aspect? Yeah, totally. So, I mean, uh, you know, when it comes to the actual video that you have, um, I, I think one of the things that a lot of us don't think about, or maybe most of us don't even know, I didn't know, to be honest, until I started studying this area, is that, is that, the, uh, is that TikTok uh, has tools, obviously. I know AI is such a buzzword, but it really is. It's, it's AI ha- inside of TikTok that is that is able to uh, track your footage and 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 take out key features of your of your footage. So if I was to upload a video of me right now, as you see me onto TikTok, it would automatically you know uh, target that there's a guitar in my shot, and it would take that into account. Oh, maybe maybe this footage that he's creating is something for the guitar community, and so we're gonna take a little bit of his audience that 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 we're going to serve this to at the beginning, the sample audience to check who likes it or not. And we're going to serve some of that to guitarists because clearly he is one. And, and so maybe they're going to be interested in that. But here's the thing. If I'm not talking about guitars, if I'm talking about, um, I don't know, Tylenol and, and, and the effects of Tylenol, then a guitarist is going to see it and not give a hoot, right? So, so I'm automatically going to lose a little bit of my sample audience to someone who is not interested in my content because of the guitar in the back of my shot. You know, um, that's that's obviously a, a pretty pretty crazy situation. But yeah. the situations beyond that, or or the other factors beyond that, are a little less um, <laughs> a little less crazy. Which is the idea of keywords, right? So um, if I was making a video where I'm reviewing Elixir guitar strings, and I jump on the video and I say. Hey everyone, just got home from work and uh, I was shopping on Amazon and I found these Polyweb Elixir guitar strings. Usually I use Diaderios, but uh, check these. I'm going to try Elixir guitar strings out today and see how they sound. Okay, if I do that, I've already added keywords to that video that it's going to, that, that again, the algorithm is going to serve that sample audience to people who might be interested in Amazon because I said Amazon. It might serve it to people who are interested in Diaderio because I said Diaderio. You know, so so really it's about like creating your script and creating your concept before you start shooting, even your copy, like create it all before you start shooting so that you're really making sure that the algorithm knows, okay, you only want to reach like this group of people, like really niche down as much as you can. I feel like I need to take a shot every time I say the word niche because I say it all the time, but like niche down as much as you can. The drinking game for this video. Yeah, right. Yeah. Just start the start the little <laughs> counter at the bottom. <laughs> yeah. But uh but yeah, it's you know, for those that don't know, um TikTok, every time you upload a a, a video to TikTok, uh it serves it to three hundred to five hundred people. Um of those three hundred to five hundred people, that's called your sample audience. And it's taking everything into account that we're talking about, stuff in your background keywords that you're saying, what your copy is, what your hashtags are, what any on-screen titles are. It's taking all of that into account uh, and if and looking at all those different keywords, all those different images and deciding, okay, let's, let's serve it to all of these people and see which group of, of those people stick to this content so we can keep serving more of it to them. That's why all of your videos, even if it's a crappy video that doesn't end up doing anything, has at least... 200 to 300 views on it because it's yeah. serving it to that's the sample audience the, it's just not passing the sample audience and moving forward into some into something beyond that um i've seen a an interesting case where where people would notice that oh i'm gonna get you know 200 to 300 views per video almost no matter what because of that sample audience so then they're like i'm just gonna post three times a day and mm-hmm. then they do that 
And then it seems like the algorithm is almost like throttling it even more. Sure. In some cases, like they're like, oh, you're, you're never punching past the seed audience. And so they're like, well, if I can get 300 views, I'll just post a million times a day. So I, overall, it's going to be a lot. And then the algorithm starts throttling it to like 50. <laughs> yeah. And you've, you've seen like the, the videos aren't working and the algorithm is like, okay, they're trying to milk it. So let's just throttle it even more. That's interesting. I, I haven't, I haven't, I don't know personally, like I haven't seen those situations, but in, in what I, in what I understand uh, of SEO, it makes sense, right? Because yeah. If you are creating, if you are creating videos, especially if they're not, if they're not like thought through and targeted, I mean, three videos a day, there's no way you can be putting like tons of pre-production into that. Right. No. Like, and, and so that's the thing. If you are, if you are diluting more and more what you're about, then, then it's like the algorithm is not going to know who you're for. And therefore you are going to end up with lower view counts anyway, just because who are you for? Right. Like you're, 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 you're lukewarm. There's nothing about you that is like explaining anything to a specific audience. And so in that situation, I, I believe that, you know, that, that mm -hmm. if you do three videos a day and it's kind of just about whatever, uh, you know, maybe one's a trend, maybe one is like you talking, like who knows what you're talking about, billion keywords right there. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like at, at that point, what audience are you for? Like, and, like, and that works for like, Cl clips of music so like this particular person that i'm thinking of does instrumental music and they they make youtube videos where they sync their instrumental music to like beautiful footage like underwater you know, i mean un underwater hour-long video um and then they'll cut that up into chunks and just kind of schedule them out so it's it's like very specific what they're doing yeah i you know it, they're just kind of cranking it out because they love they'll make this hour-long video and now from that one hour long video, they could get like 40 cuts or something, you know? For yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, not to jump the gun in our conversation, but, and maybe we can come back to this if you want, but I mean, branding has a ton to do with that, right? Because, you know, the other thing that you have to consider is like, are fans of your music scuba divers? <laughs> like, is there, <laughs> you know what I mean though? Like, like what, like what is the... What is the connection? What is the what is the what is the contact point to your target audience visually that that keeps people sticking around? You know, and if it's yeah. if it's an underwater thing, you know, even if and and you're doing I don't know, like like synthwave music, like that might not be the best. That might you might not get the best result just because it's not an image that that community is even interested in or looking for. I do want to say though that the that the opposite is not only true i've seen it be effective which is like there was this i just saw this interview with this guy who he's a country artist and he created a TikTok where there's like someone wakeboarding on the back of a boat and and the the guy asked him like why did you choose uh wake like are you a wakeboarder and he was like no i've actually never been wakeboarding he's like but my community like the country country fans love going to the lake like they love wakeboarding. They, and so I knew it was something that the fans would be interested in because, because wakeboarding is adjacent to country music. It's like one of the offshoots of the culture. And so there is something to that in, in that brilliance, right? And kind of yeah. also not to mention going back to what we're talking about with, with brand partnerships, you know, country music, mm -hmm. a wakeboarding company is appropriate to, to reach out to and ask for a sponsorship or, or, a, or, a, or a partnership you know, collaboration. So now well, when it comes to hashtag strategies, uh, Insta I, you know, there's like a million people online that talk about hashtag strategies for Instagram and TikTok. And in the past, there was a period for Instagram where it was just, they give you a maximum of 30. So stuff in like 28 or something. <laughs> and I, I think that those, I don't think those people are still recommending that, but what's the general vibe with TikTok and hashtag? Right. Do they matter? Yeah, it, it does matter. It's it, it uh, it's it. They're way more they're way more important uh, on TikTok than Instagram. I know Instagram has like a little bit of like it kind of it kind of on Instagram. It's more about like sticking you into a subfolder than it is searchability at this mm -hmm. point when it comes to hashtags. Um, on TikTok, it's still very much about searchability, right? Because you have these large 
these large hashtag cultures, you know, music talk is, is a huge culture on, on TikTok, and that's built around that, ha that hashtag. Um, I will say, though, that that is, and, and this is something else that, that I really preach, all, is, is the idea that you have to niche down way further than music talk to be seen. Like, if you go to music talk right now, and you search hashtag music talk, and you pull that up and you see the videos, but not, first of all, most of them aren't gonna be from like right now, right? Because they're gonna be the top videos that are performing, which could be from two years ago, three years ago. You're gonna see a lot of blue check marks. You're gonna see a lot of, you know, um, major label artists or large, or, or large influencers on TikTok. You're just not gonna, it's, it's still, it's not niche enough. Like, like, and this is, this is kind of the the big thing that I really try to try to emphasize is that like if you think you're niche, you're probably not niche enough yet. You know, like like hashtag hashtag heavy metal is not niched down enough, even if you're a heavy metal band, right? Mm -hmm. Because because you're competing with all the people who are the most popular in that hashtag, um, and if you're trying to be discovered as a heavy metal band, that there's just it's it's pointless. So my my point is to like go down even more than that. Um, what I like to do is is three to four hashtags. Um, one of those ha if you're doing four, then then one of those hashtags I reserve for whatever your specific brand identity is. So for me, it would be Taryn Gray hashtag Taryn Gray. That way that way every it's like I am the expert on myself, right? Like this is this is generally what I talk about. It's like Taryn Gray. So that would be that would be how I reserve one of those, and then the other three would be like I say I say niche, mid niche, super niche, right? So like so like niche would be um, uh, if you're heavy metal, niche would be like heavy metal Los Angeles if you're if you're living in Los Angeles, or or so, or look for something. I'm not saying that's even a hashtag, but like look for something that has um, like. A little bit, yeah, probably. I guess in one example, instead of using heavy metal as your main niche, maybe it's a sub. You're in a subgenre of heavy metal, like alternative metal. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, alternative totally. metal probably doesn't have a huge volume, or maybe your uh, metal core. Would that yeah. be niche enough in that situation? I think. I think. I think uh, metal core maybe not, but maybe alternative maybe. Okay. Uh, I mean, yeah, I don't know. I'd, I'd have to look, to be honest. I mean, it's more of like a size thing. So if you're it's a size you're, thing, yeah. If you look at like the number of posts using the hashtags, or do you like go in the hashtag pages and look at how big the videos are? Yeah. So it used to be a little bit easier. You used to be able to look at how many views uh, there were per hashtag, and they've changed it to how many posts per hashtag uh, is, is now the thing. So, so yeah, when it, when it comes to posts per hashtag, you probably want something above like 200 to 300 videos for, for, mm -hmm. your, for your area that's like super niche, or sorry, for your area that's niche, right? And then, and then boiling down from that, you're going to, you're gonna choose like mid niche is gonna be even lower than that, maybe like, 50 to 100 videos, and then super niche is going to be like zero to 25 or something. You know, how do you treat Instagram then? Like, well, what do so, you do separately there? Yeah, so Instagram is all about community. Like, commu like Meta, Meta is about community at the end of the day, right? So this is the thing. Actually, to be honest, this is what really got me thinking about all of this. Like when I was first putting putting all this information together about TikTok. It started because I realized, oh, TikTok is terrible at community. Like we don't like. Here's here's a case in point. Like it. Like think of the last video that you saw on TikTok. Like 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 get it in your head. Like okay, what was like a, an interesting, either the last or an interesting video you saw recently on TikTok? And then once you have that idea in your head, tell me tell me the name of the username of the person who posted that. You know. Like chances are most people you're not going to be able to tell me. Like honestly, like I I watch TikTok all the time. I I probably other than the big influencers, I probably could only name maybe like 5 to 10 usernames or or people on TikTok. Yeah. Like it's it's not built for community, it's built for instant inform it's built for instantaneous information. Even the people I see all the time 
I don't know their day. Like there's the guy with the dog with the mouth snappies, you know, you, you know, I don't know if you know that. Yeah. Guy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there's yeah. The guy who would be, he's like a teacher and he's in the school room and he'd be making fun of the kids and he would like fall over and knock the desk over. And, yeah. Um, I don't know any of their names. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's honestly the big difference between TikTok and Instagram. Like Instagram is built for you to find your community and it's built for you to find your people group and, and, Obviously, obviously, because to be honest, when I'm on Instagram, I get served more like we've, you and I have talked about this, like we're both into the synth wave community. I get, I get served on Instagram way more synth wave art than I do friends. Like, like my own <laughs> friends don't get served on my feed more. Like it's probably like 20% friends, 80% synth wave music tips or, or synth wave art. And the reason is because Instagram is going, okay, here's your, this is your community is Synthwave. So that's what we're going to continue to give to you since that's what you continue to respond to. One thing I want to make sure I cover is how do you feel about running ads on social media? Does that impact organic reach? I get this question all the time. Mm. And I've always told people in my experience, like they'll be like, oh, well, they see you're giving them money. So they're going to stop giving you organic reach and force you to pay for it. In my experience, I've never seen any evidence whatsoever for that. Yeah. Um, what is your experience? It's a big, it's a huge rumor. It really is. It's, it's like one of the largest rumors, which is like, oh, don't start paying for ads because then the, because then the algorithm will know that you're willing to pay and you won't, you won't create content. Um, it's unfortunately bogus. Uh, you know, I've, I, I've watched people who have actually done these experiments to see if that was the case. And it's not, uh, what is, what is more common is that you have spent all of this time you've spent time, you've actually done pre-production you've, you know, you've actually done production and post-production on this piece that you're boosting, that you're going to be putting out into the world. And in the meantime, you haven't, because you're focused on that, you haven't been focusing as much on the content that's going to follow it. And because of that, it, the rest of the content is coming out just a little less effective naturally, you know, because you're not putting in the same uh, effort in terms of like pre-production or, or production or, or, or post-production into that. And so I think a lot of the drop off that people see is not because all of a sudden TikTok knows you're willing to spend money. It's because the content that you have following your ad is not strong enough to you know, to, to, to have that kind of a, of an impact. Um, mm-hmm. that's the first thing. The second thing is, uh, if you are, I don't, I, you, you, you don't have this problem if, and I know this cause I work with these client with clients like this, you don't have this problem if you're, if all of your content points to you being the expert at one thing, right? So if your ad is very specifically focused at a target group, that is looking for the expert to, for whatever, right? Then yeah. like, then you're not gonna have any, any of that problem if all the rest of your content is also additional content that's supporting that area. The main problem is that musicians don't look at themselves as the expert in a field. You know, may, maybe they look at themselves as an artist or as, a, or as like a specific genre, but they don't necessarily think of themselves as, oh, I have this whole I have this whole um, ecosystem around me of information that I can deliver because I am the expert at metalcore, right? And I and I know and I know like it's cringy. I, I get it. Like even saying it out loud, like oh, but then what? What do you mean? Like I'm supposed to like talk about like the three best vocal techniques for metalcore artists? And it's like I'm not saying you have to do that. That that could be the answer, but if that to you is like selling out and like super cringe and weird, then no, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that. I'm saying that anything else that you can think of that you're passionate about within metalcore, talk about that. Like maybe there's, maybe you have a specific guitar sound that you created, like share that guitar sound with us. What is that? What, what does that signal chain look like? You know, or, or whatever it is. Like there's, there's other areas in that where you don't have to feel like, you don't have to feel like the traditional, like influencer. Hey guys, top five metal bands, you know, like, you don't, like, you don't have to do it that way. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? So much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks so much for hopping on the show. Yeah. Thank you, thank you for having me, Andrew. I really appreciate um, it. Yeah. Everyone check out Taryn's links below and, and uh, 
we'll and check you. out Andrew Southam's music, Southworth's music on Spotify. And fireworks and going. <laughs> <laughs> Love it.